Hello, my name is Tessa asquith -Lam and I'm an artist. I work at the City Arts Centre and other venues, running workshops and also leading described tours for the visually impaired. In today's described tour, we're going to be looking at several artworks from the 1920s. The first artwork we're going to be talking about is called The Chalk Pit by George Henry. This was painted in 1922. It measures 119 centimetres high by 145 centimetres wide, so it's a really substantial large landscape painting. It shows two young women in sun hats sat in a beautiful landscape of the South Downs, a landscape characterised by soft, closely cropped green grasses and also chalk emerging from the landscape. The chalk pit in this painting is probably a quarry and chalk itself used to be quarried for use in the building trade and also in laundry. In the lines of the chalk, in the sort of layers of chalk, they also used to find flint which was used in building work. If we divide the painting into three horizontal bands, into sort of thirds, the top third is all beautiful blue sky. The sky is interrupted though right in the middle by fluffy white clouds and towards the right hand side by diagonal greyish strokes which seem to indicate rain on the way. So it's a really sort of changeable sky, it couldn't be more sort of different. It goes from on the left just blue to in the middle cloudy and then on the right kind of rain and grey. It's quite a mixture of the sky. Coming down the next third is all trees and also a little bit more hints of the kind of chalk um, bands in the landscape and soft trees and kind of kind of golden colours and greens and a band of quite lush trees stretches across the centre of the painting. As we come down the painting towards the bottom third the green is kind of coming away and being revealed is the chalk and this the chalk sort of is cut away into the painting on the right hand side and it looks a bit like when you take a bite out of an apple when you've got the sort of green and then the bright kind of white of the chalk looks like a kind of bitten apple. There's sort of slight ridges and shadows on the chalk which make it look really kind of stark white against the green. In the centre of the picture, two women are kind of obscured from us slightly in that the woman on the right hand side is wearing a yellow jacket and wears a straw hat and she's looking out towards the chalk pit and it looks like she's got a sketchbook on her lap so maybe she's drawing the scene. And her companion, which sits to the left of her, is wearing a kind of russet coloured long jacket and has a white straw hat and a black skirt and looks like they're reading a book. To the right of the two women are some kind of branches of which look like kind of blossoms or white flowers on sticks. The soft foreground is all kind of lovely soft greenish brush strokes suggesting a really lovely place to sit in this, in this kind of really lovely landscape. The 1920s was a time when travel was becoming much more popular and possible for more people due to the um, kind of expansion of the railway network and people having more free time. So hobbies like camping and walking and cycling were really popular. And this feels a bit like one of those railway posters from the time advertising a really lovely summery, you know, bright holiday. The next painting I'm going to discuss is called View from the Mound, Edinburgh Looking West and this was painted by an artist called William Crozier around 1929. It measures 80 centimetres high by 70 centimetres wide and it shows the top of the mound in Edinburgh looking towards the castle and it's a road that curves off from the top of the mound up towards Castle Hill in Edinburgh and so the picture starts at the bottom with a very wide roadway and then it curves up towards the left hand side of the picture. In the dead centre of the picture are two figures making their way up the hill through a kind of snowy sludgy road. It looks like the kind of landscape when You've maybe had snow the day before and lots of cars have been up and down the roadway exposing part of the tarmac but still leaving snow on the pavements. There's two figures in the centre of the image and they're making their way up the hill. The figure on the left hand side is wearing dark clothing and the figure very close to them is wearing red clothing. 
On the left hand side of the image is the very ecclesiastic looking kind of um, very tall structure which is a building called New College and that's painted in very sort of warm brown tones with kind of golden sort of beigey highlights. And beyond that, on the far side of the figures, is a building called Ramsey Gardens with its red rooftops and little turrets. In the distance of this painting, it paints a very kind of flat, pale sky, is the silhouette in kind of greyish blue of Edinburgh Castle itself. And if you've ever been to Edinburgh, you know that the castle sits right in the middle of the city on this huge rock. And when it snows, the crevices in the rock fill up with snow which lingers there for quite some time and that's what we've got in this picture. We've got the greyish silhouette of the castle with snow still lingering in those crevices. Coming towards where we're actually standing at the bottom of this road, we've got a curve which starts on the right hand side of the picture and leads towards the left hand side of the picture with railings and this really is kind of funneling your eye and leading you into the picture. Now William Crozier sadly died when he was quite young. He died when he was 37 after an accident in his studio, but he'd had a very promising career up till then. He'd been educated at Edinburgh College of Art and had traveled to um, Paris and experienced Cubism. And he was part of something called the 1922 group. And the 1922 group, well, they were um, a group which enjoyed sort of modernist painting and could exhibit together. And other members of that group include William Gillis and William McTaggart. This painting feels very sort of sketchy and loose at the bottom half of the picture. And this slightly more sort of painted, thicker paint, I'd say, towards the centre of the picture. There's a lot of dry brush strokes in the bottom part of the picture, on the, especially on the road and the tarmac, and you feel an overwhelming sense of kind of an icy cold day, which you'll know in Edinburgh we get quite a few of. The next painting we're going to consider is Dreams by David Simpson Foggy, which was painted around 1928. This painting measures 108 centimetres high by 88 centimetres wide and depicts a young woman with fair hair which has been plaited into two long plaits tied with white ribbons, wearing a white sleeveless shift, sitting in a window with a bright light coming from the left hand side of the image onto her face as she looks towards the left. Her hands cross across her body towards the right hand side and her fingers lace together in the darker right hand side of the painting. The painting is a study in darkness and light and soft chalky tones. The artist taught life drawing at Edinburgh College of Art and this comes as no surprise to me when I look at this picture. It's full of the surety and kind of knowledge of knowing what happens in the structure of the body that comes from a lot of life drawing. It's also a study about how light hits the form and how you use that um, oil paint to represent light and dark. It has a very chalky kind of pale greys, blues, greens, a kind of golden colour in her hair. It's a really, really beautifully painted picture. The face of the young woman, which is um, towards the top of the painting, just slightly to the right, is quite a serious face, like she's kind of contemplating something, maybe having a memory or, um, you know, contemplating something quite serious and she's looking out towards the left hand side and where the light hits her face, her face is almost kind of bright white, especially at the top of her hairline. Towards the right hand side of her face obviously it gets much darker as it goes into shadow and she's got quite rosy cheeks. Moving down her body the light hits this um, sort of shift like dress that she's wearing you get the feeling that maybe she's just got up in the morning and that she's plaited her hair like that to sleep in and that she'll soon undo those plaits and put them into her hairstyle for the day. Her arm, the top of her arms are bare so again it makes you feel that this is like um, a part of her underclothes or maybe some sort of night dress that she's wearing and the light hitting the arm that's nearest the window is very very bright on her skin and the arm on the right hand side is much darker in shadow. The two hands which kind of um, reach over towards the bottom right hand corner of the picture end in her, her very sort of darkened hands and they thread together, the fingers of those hands 
fed together really beautifully it's almost like she's holding her own hand it's a very beautiful kind of gesture that she's making the bottom left hand corner of the painting is filled with her knees and they look like they're wearing maybe white stockings and they just sort of peep out from the bottom of her her shift dress and they look like they've got kind of white highlights around the edges of them the whole left hand side of the picture is taken up with the window which has got white glazing bars and beyond that an iron balcony with a crisscross diamond pattern at the bottom and sort of palmate kind of leaf patterns at the top and beyond that what looks like a park. In between the window and the girl is a white net curtain which forms a kind of passage, a kind of barrier between her and the outside world. It's a really beautiful image of light and dark and it's really sort of got this surety and clarity of vision about it and it's very contemplative and the title Dreams makes you think that she's thinking about something very sort of personal and very sort of um, maybe a memory or something that she's hoping for in the future. The next artwork we're going to look at is this time a sculpture. This is a sculpture called Portrait of an Artist, William Skirch Cumming, and it was made by James Pittendry McGillivray in about 1920, and it's a bronze. It measures 76 centimetres high by 52 centimetres wide across the front, and then 43 centimetres deep. So it's a really big bronze sculpture. And it's the bust, so the upper torso of a mustachioed man with short, close cropped hair. And looking at it straight on, he's looking towards the left hand side. And from his point of view, I suppose he'd be looking towards his right. He has no arms, but the, um, the arm, his right arm is sort of raised slightly, um, but cut off. So you can imagine that it would, if his arm did continue, it would kind of raise up slightly. And he has a twisting posture. He's wearing an open necked smock with great big folds that kind of flow around his body and it's opened at the neck and the chest. He's looking very sort of determinedly and the surface of this sculpture, which is a bronze, is a kind of dark, rich brown colour and it glistens with kind of reflected light in the highlights. And the surface of this sculpture is covered with the finger marks of the artist as they modelled the material that would then be cast in bronze, presumably clay. And when you get close to this sculpture, you can see the individual finger marks as clay was applied and moved around on the surface of this sculpture. So it has a real liveliness and twisting kind of dynamic feeling. Now this, um, this friend, William Skirch Cumming, was a, a friend who shared McGillivray's interest in Scottish history and culture. And McGillivray himself was known as a painter, a poet and a musician, but most kind of known as a sculptor. And just how, as in um, paintings of this period, you've got very visible brush strokes and kind of lively movement in the paint. This sculpture has that same liveliness in the way that you can see the finger marks and the twisting movement of this form. The last painting I'm going to describe is called Rest Time in the Life Class. And this was painted by Dorothy Johnston in 1923. It measures 135 centimetres high by 119 centimetres wide. It shows the model Poppy Lowe resting between poses in an all-female life class at Edinburgh College of Art. She forms the centre of this image. She has short dark cropped hair in a very sort of 1920s bobbed style and she's resting on her left arm which is on top of some draped boxes. She's got um, a kind of drape across the lower part of her body and the top part of her body is bare and her other arm kind of hangs down by her side. Her feet are kind of tucked up under her and she has very pale skin and the drapes are, all contribute to the being a kind of sense of lightness in the middle of this image. This continues down towards the bottom of the image where there's a large drawing board with a big piece of white paper on it. Now when we look at this picture we can see the pose that the model's been taking which was much more upright and this has been sketched in charcoal onto the paper. In front of that are two students called Kate Price and Belle Kilgower and they're shown almost in kind of real strong profile against this white drawing board. 
the student on the left hand side leans into the image wearing a dark blue pinafore dress with red sleeves and she's got her hair um, curled into what were called shells around her ears they look a bit like headphones and she's shown in profile her friend on the right hand side of the image has red hair and this is very closely cropped but has curly edges and she's shown almost in profile against the white of her drawing board in her right hand she holds a stick of charcoal and she appears to be sort of working on the legs of this drawing in the background there are four um, other students there are two on the left hand side one with red hair and one with dark hair wearing green top and a red top and they're in kind of the darkness up at the top and they look like they're just sort of chatting on the right hand side is this is the artist herself so dorothy johnson's painted herself into this picture and she was a, an art tutor at Edinburgh College of Art so she's put herself in teaching two students she's shown in full figure with her right arm raised towards um, an easel there's a further easel behind her she's got one leg stepping back as if she's just sort of stepping back from the picture to get a good look at it and check the proportions the two students behind her are listening very intently one wears a red top with a green skirt and the other wears a blue top and they look like they're really taking notice of what she's saying. Dorothy Johnson gave up teaching at Edinburgh College of Art about a year after this picture was painted when she married her fellow artist D.M. Sutherland. There was a law at the time called the marriage bar which meant that, it, that you had to give up your job when you got married but she continued to exhibit under her own name after this time. It's a really kind of evocative um, piece of painting and it really reminds me of my own time at Edinburgh College of Art and me and my friends all working away in the life room. As a really nice add-on to the last image, I'm happy to be able to share with you two fascinating photographs that were provided to us by Flora Johnston of her granny's time at Edinburgh College of Art between 1921 and 1924. And this is the exact same time as rest time in the life class and one of the photographs seems to show a really really similar group of young female artists in a life class. This picture is a, a landscape format photograph in black and white and it shows seven young women standing at easels in a wood panelled room with a dark curtain hanging down at the top right hand side. The seven women have mostly got their backs towards us and wear smocks and have short hair. The life model stands to centre left of the image and she's not resting, she's doing her pose at this moment and she's got her hands on her thighs leaning slightly forward. The students all have um, different sort of boxes and stools next to them for their equipment but one of the students is looking straight out at us on the right hand side and this is Patricia Keith, Flora Johnson's granny who's really smiling out at us from the past and it's a really sort of evocative image of that time. The other photograph that we have is an image of some of her artworks which have been placed against a wall, some framed and some pinned on drawing boards and it looks like a critique or part of um, an, uh, you know, an exhibition as part of your art college life, you have lots of those and there are life studies, still lives and also some more sort of graphic illustrative works. So they're a really nice sort of snapshot back to that time and we're really grateful that we've been able to show them today. So I hope you've enjoyed looking through these photographs and also these um, artworks of Scottish art from the 1920s.